This is something that goes with your philosophy today. Get out of cash and get into assets because we don't know what's going to happen to the dollar. Well, cash is always a bad investment. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, I mean, when people said cash is king a year ago, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, cash wasn't producing anything and it was sure to go down in value over time. And then you always want to be sure you have enough. I mean, <laughs> it's like oxygen. You want to be sure it's around, you know, but you don't need to have, you don't need to have excessive amounts of it around. And cash, we will always have enough cash yeah. around. But anytime we have surplus cash around, I'm unhappy. I mean, I would much rather have good businesses than cash. And, and uh, we found a chance in the last year, thereabouts, to mm -hmm. deploy. We, we came in with something over 40 billion in cash, right. and we've got about 20 billion now, and we've had some earnings. So we, we put a lot of cash to work, and I like that. No, I'd much rather own a good business than have cash. And it is a hedge against the dollar? Well, you can say all assets are a hedge against okay. the, the dollar. Right. I mean, but all you know is that the dollar is going to be worth less 10, 20, 30 years from now. I say worth less, not right. worthless. Right. <laughs> you want to watch that. <laughs> yeah, that's but right. that's true of almost every currency that I can think of. Uh, the question is how much uh, it depreciates in value. But cash, cash is not a place to. Uh, stocks sell at silly prices from time to time. Most stocks at one time or another sell at very silly prices. And it doesn't take a high IQ to figure out that they're cheap, but it does take a temperament that's willing to step up and actually act. Uh, I tell people, if they're going in the investment business, if you've got 160 IQ, sell 30 points to somebody else because you won't need it. I mean, that, <laughs> that, I mean, I figured out very early, you don't have to be that smart in this business, which is fortunate, but you do have to have the right temperament and you have to be able to ignore what other people are saying and simply look at the facts and decide, is this stock which is selling at X worth 2X? And occasionally you'll find things like that. And if, when you don't find them, you don't do anything. Omission is way bigger than commission. There's big opportunities in life have to be seized. We don't do very many things, but when we get the chance to do something that's right and big, we've got to do it. And even to, to do it in a small scale is just as big a mistake almost as not doing it at all. I mean, you got to grab them when they come. And you're not going to get 500 great opportunities. You would be better off if when you got out of school here, you got a punch card with 20 punches on it. And every big financial, every financial decision you made, you used up a punch. You'd get very rich because you'd think through very hard each one. I mean, you went to a cocktail party and somebody talked about a company. You didn't even understand what they did or couldn't pronounce the name but they made some money last week and another one like it. You wouldn't buy it if you only had 20 punches on that card. There's a temptation to dabble, if, uh, particularly during bull markets. And stocks is so easy, you know. It's easier now than ever because you can do it online. You know, just you click it in and maybe it goes up a point and you get excited about that and you buy another one the next day and so on. You can't make any money over time doing that. But if you had a punch card with only 20 punches, you weren't gonna get another one the rest of your life, you would think a long time before every investment decision and you would make good ones and you'd make big ones. And you probably wouldn't even use all 20 punches in your lifetime, but you wouldn't need to. The best boat you can have is your own talent. They can't take it away from you. They, inflation can't take it from you. Right. Taxes can't take it from you. So when I talk to students, I see these students and I tell them, you know, you're a million dollar asset. I would pay you $100,000, the MBAs, for 10% of the earnings for the rest of your life. So that makes you a million dollar asset. Now, if you can do something to increase that value 50%, if you can learn to communicate better verbally or in written form, and you become 50% more, that's $500,000 just by improving yourself. I mean, it, nobody can take that away from you. And, and so I urge everybody, you know, when they're, I talk to them in high school about this, and uh, in colleges, just develop the habits. You've got the brain power, you've got the energy, but develop the habits of success and, and look around you at the people that you admire and list what makes you admire them compared to somebody else that looks equally strong or equally uh, talented. Those are things that you can do. I mean, just write them down. And, and people like people that are, they're, they like them if they're humorous, if they're friendly, if they give credit to the other fellow. I mean, uh, and they don't like them if they're stingy, you know, or they overstate and overpromise and all those sort of things. Well, that's a decision. That's a decision you make. So I encourage everybody to build your own moat around yourself. Defining your circle of competence is the most important aspect of investing. It's not how large your circle is. You don't have to be an expert on everything. But knowing where the perimeter of that circle of what you know and what you don't know is and staying inside of it is all important. Tom Watson Sr., who started IBM, said in his book, he said, 
I'm no genius, but I'm smart in spots, and I stay around those spots. And, and you know, that is the key. Uh, so if I understand a few things, and I stick in that arena, I'll do okay. And if I don't understand something, but I get all excited about it because my neighbors are talking about it, and stocks are going up and everything, they start fooling around someplace else, eventually I'll get cream, and I should. If you buy a farm, do you go up and look, you know, every couple of weeks to see how far the corn is up? And, uh, you know, do you worry too much about whether somebody says this is going to be a year of low prices because exports are being affected or anything like that? You know, you buy a farm and you hold it for, I've got one farm that I bought in the 1980s and my son runs it, but I've been there once. It doesn't grow faster if I go and stare at it. You know, I can't cheer for it, you know more effort, more effort, or something like that. And I know there's going to be some years when prices are going to be good and some when the prices aren't going to be good. I know there's years when yields will be better than others. But about the farm, and, and I don't care about economic predictions on it or anything of the sort. I do care that over the years it's well tended to in terms of rotating crops, and I hope yields get better, which they generally have. In fact, that farm 100 years ago would have probably produced 30 bushels, maybe 35 bushels of corn per acre. And, now in a good year, you know, it'd be 200. I mean, we've really made progress in this country. That's one reason commodity prices, if you go back a couple hundred years, they've moved so little is because we've just gotten better and better at whether it's cotton or whether it's, it's corn or soybeans or all kinds of things. And you and I have benefited from that. And so Apple's kind of like a farm. Well, it's a long-term investment. And if you own the, the best auto dealership in town, uh, the best brand and had somebody good running it. You wouldn't drop by every day and say, you know, how many people have come in today or, you know, I think interest rates are going up a little. Maybe it'll slow down our sales or anything. No, you buy it knowing there's 365 days a year and you're going to own it for 20 years. So that's 7,300 days. And, you know, they're going to, things are going to be <laughs> different from day to day and year to year. You shouldn't buy it if the day to day stuff is important. What he did was he got me thinking not as a stock as something with a ticker symbol that wiggles around and that you know that you look at charts on or anything he, he, he taught me to think about it as part of the business and that was vital and he taught me not to really pay any attention to stock market fluctuations except when they were working in my favor so that not to get you know elated because something had gone up or depressed because it went down so if i knew the facts on something and it went down i bought more of it you know and, and uh, because i looked at it as a business People ask me what they should take in business school and or even if they don't go to business school, what they need to know before getting in business. And I tell them, you know, you have to understand accounting. It's the language. I mean, it's like being in a foreign country without knowing the language if you're in business and you don't understand accounting. So it, you want to get as comfortable with that as you are with the English language. It's made me a lot of money because I, I listened to what Ray Dean had to say 53 or 4 years ago and have been able to understand what I was seeing on pieces of paper, what that told me about businesses and the limitations of what it told me about businesses. I mean, I, but that's the way we invest. Charlie Munger and I have been making stock decisions and business decisions one way or another together now for 55 years. We have never let, well, the macro doesn't enter into it, nor does political. We have not made decisions differently because one party or the other's in power. We have not made decisions based on whether we thought interest rates were going to go up or down or you know what was going to happen with labor negotiations someplace. You know, you don't want to give up what you know how to do because of opinions which you don't know whether are right or not and which are going to be transitory in any event. So you really go out there every day and do whatever makes the most sense. So when we buy the auto dealerships last week, we don't factor in anything about the Fed, about the deadlock in politics, about what's going on around the world. Those are all important things, but they don't affect whether those dealerships, which we're buying to own 100 years, they don't affect whether they're going to make money in the year 2024 or the 2034 or 2044. And the, the important thing is whether we get a good business with good management at a sensible price. Famous lesson about a margin of safety, that you don't drive a truck that weighs 9,900 pounds across a bridge that says limit 10,000 pounds because you can't be that sure about it. If you see something like that, you go down a little further down the road and you find one that says limit 20,000 pounds and that's the one you drive across.